I'm going to commit right now to letting go of making myself wrong. Good job, Mel Robbins, for getting out there. Good job for trying out an episode where I would be walking and talking and recording it on my iPhone. And good job for having the presence of mind to realize it would be a better listening experience for you and a better experience for me to unpack this really important topic of letting go. How do you let go of what no longer serves you? I got to say, I get questions about this all the time. In fact, just yesterday, I got this question from Cheryl. Mel, how do you know that the thing you're holding on to is meant to be let go of versus fighting for it even harder? Do you have any thoughts or perhaps tools to help discover it or encourage the universe to bring that epiphany along? In other words, how do I know when it's time to let go? All right, everybody, get ready, because this is one of the most important aspects of creating a better life and of being a happier person. We spend so much time focusing on what we need to do, what we need to add in, what we need to change. And have you stopped to consider that the best place to make a change is by letting go of things, of projects, of thinking patterns, of relationships that no longer serve you. And the big question is how? How do you know when it's time? And I have got not only a fantastic visual metaphor to help you understand this concept, but I also have a really interesting way to approach this. We're going to talk about the fact that your energy and your intuition is always there to tell you when it's time to let something go because it no longer serves you. So to get into this topic, I want to introduce the metaphor. And it was the metaphor I had started talking about as we were on that hike together. I mean, here in the United States anyways, it is autumn. It is the fall season. We are all about pumpkins. We are in harvest time. There are corn stalks everywhere. We're getting ready for orange and red and all those amazing colors and carrot cake. I mean, I love this time of year. And I realize it may not be fall where you are. Uh, if you're you know, part of our global fan base halfway around the world, it's summertime. Don't get hung up on the fact that I'm using fall as a metaphor. I personally believe whenever it is that you are listening to this episode, even if it's two years from now, you're listening to this right now because you are meant to hear it right now, because there is a new season that needs to start in your life, and that's going to require you to let go of things that no longer serve you. And so let's talk about the metaphor of what happens to a tree when the fall season hits. And in researching this for you, because, you know, it's one thing to just kind of tell you a metaphor. It's another thing to really understand it and explain it. This was fascinating. I know we we learned about chlorophyll and fall and the life cycle of a tree in elementary school, but I had forgotten most of this stuff. So check this out. The reason why a tree has leaves is because the tree needs energy to survive. It needs energy to grow. And the leaves have a very particular purpose. The leaves are there to take the sunlight and convert it to energy so that the tree can grow. And in exchange, the tree gives a ton of water back to these leaves. I mean, this process of the leaves sprouting and the leaves growing and the leaves taking its surface area and converting the sun into energy so the tree can go from a tiny little acorn to a mighty oak, that is a lot of energy. And there's this reciprocal nature to the relationship that a tree has to its leaves because the tree has to bring in tons of water in order to fuel this energy exchange. And here's the reason why leaves fall off a tree. In the middle of winter, at least here in the United States, when the ground is frozen and snowpack is on top, there is no water for the tree. And if those leaves with their big flat surface were to stay on that tree through winter, the leaves would kill the tree. It would suck the tree dry of all the water that it needs. 
an interesting thing about fall is that, you know, we look at the, the leaves turning and we look at the leaves dropping gently and falling down to the ground as this beautiful thing that happens. This natural thing that happens. It's so lovely. It's just wonderful. Isn't this delightful? Do you want to know that this is almost like a violent act? That the trees are pushing those leaves off its branches. The tree is basically going, yo, uh, if you are hanging around on my branches through the wintertime, you are going to suck me dry of all my energy. I am going to die if you don't get off my freaking branches. The tree literally pushes them, ejects them, kicks them out of their life. Why? Because there is no reciprocal energy exchange that can happen during the winter. The tree has to conserve its energy to survive. And after the winter season, once those leaves are gone and the tree can conserve its energy instead of giving it all to that leaf while killing itself. I bet you got areas of your life where you're giving all your energy into a relationship or into your work or into some stupid thinking pattern that you've been doing for years that makes you feel bad. You put all your energy in one direction. You get nothing in return. That's what fall is for a tree. The fall season for a tree is, thank you very much for spring and summer. You were amazing. This relationship between the leaf and the tree, this was reciprocal. You got energy from me. I got energy from you. Bada bing, bada boom. And then all of a sudden, boom. This is a one-way thing. And if I hold on to these leaves, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I'm bringing that metaphor and that visual and that 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 documented point of view that this isn't just some lovely thing where the leaves you know change colors and it's so beautiful and now we all drink a pup, pumpkin spice latte that's not what this is this is a tree's survival this is about energy this is about the fact that in order to grow in order to be strong to be the best you you got to surround yourself with relationships and work and projects and friendships and habits where there is an equal reciprocal exchange that you give and you get and return. And that's where we're going to start when it comes to how I want you to think about this concept of letting go. We're going to talk about how to identify that moment when there is no longer that energy exchange that there is something that has become a complete energy suck. And when you realize, whether it's a friendship or a romantic relationship or a job or some habit or a place that you live, when you realize that something has become an energy suck on you, that's when you know it's time to let go. That's when you know, like that tree, that you better Kick that thing off your branches because it's hanging on to you or you're holding on to it. And if you keep doing that, what will happen? And you've had this happen in your life where you've held on to things for too long, where you refuse to let things go. And what did it do? It sucked you dry. It sucked you dry of your energy. It sucked you dry of your vitality. It made you feel depleted. Instead of those leaves or that project or that person withering away and, and falling to the ground so that you could regain your strength, so that you could step into a new season of your life, no, you gave it all to them. You held on for too long. Well, guess what? That's not happening anymore. Because what we're going to talk about when we come back from a short word from our sponsors, which I want you to listen to, because by the way, our sponsors, they're the reason why I can show up twice a week. There is a reciprocal exchange between us. They literally pay for this show, which is why I'm so enthusiastic about it. So we can put this out there around the world for free. So I want to give an energy exchange back to the amazing sponsors of the Mel Robbins podcast. Take a listen. We're going to be right back. Because we're going to now talk about, in detail, what do I mean by reciprocal energy exchange? And where are the major areas in your life where you tend to start to have this be a one-way thing, where you're given all the energy and you're the one that's depleted and dry? All right, I'll be right back. You hang on to my branches. We're not done yet. It's really green right now, which means these trees are holding on to it. 
chlorophyll, that chlorophyll is coming through, but in literally a matter of days, the green is gonna leave those leaves, yellow, orange, red, brown, purple. It's gonna take over and those leaves will have served their purpose and they will all of a sudden wither away and fall to the ground. That was Mel Robbins, your friend who has a degree in botany. No, just kidding. I uh, want to touch on one point from what I said on the trail before we get into this energy exchange and how you're going to use your intuition and the fact that you deserve to have an exchange, a reciprocal nature to what you give and what you receive back from it. I want to talk about one thing that I said, which is the leaves served their purpose. When the leaves are green, the leaves are bringing energy to the tree and the tree is returning energy in the form of water. The reason why the leaves start to change is because the tree starts to pull back. The tree starts pulling back on the amount of water that it is sending to the leaves. The tree is starting to let go. The leaf no longer serves a purpose. And this is an important thing to say because so often we have trouble letting go of friendships, of habits, of jobs, of, for me, where I lived and raised our kids for 26 years. We recently sold our home, and by God, I held on to that for probably two years longer than we needed to because I had trouble letting go. But what I want you to focus on is that when something has a purpose in your life, that's an amazing thing. And it's also normal for something to serve a purpose during a specific period of time and to no longer serve a purpose in your life now or in the life you want to create. And so when you honor that a friendship served a purpose, and a really good example of this is, you know how whenever you um, have a new job or you move an apartment or you move to a city, that all of a sudden the patterns in your life change and your friendships change. And your friendships change because now you're doing different things. So you're bumping into different people. It doesn't mean that you're no longer friends with the people that you used to hang out with at work. But the friends that you had at work served a particular important purpose during that period of your life. There was an equal exchange back and forth. What you gave, you received back. It's why you ate lunch with the same people every day. You enjoyed them and they enjoyed you. But now that you live somewhere else, putting a ton of energy back into that relationship when you're not going to get the same back, it doesn't serve the same purpose. And that's why when you let go of friendships, you also need to let go of the judgment on yourself, like there's something wrong with me, and am I doing something wrong, and do I have any friends? Of course you have friends. The patterns of your life have changed. You're putting energy somewhere else because you're getting energy from somewhere else. This is the natural cycle of life. It's the natural cycle of relationships. And I find that when you really honor the things that you need to let go of, whether it's a job you no longer like, or a house you no longer want to live in, or a friendship you don't see very often, or maybe it's some habit, maybe it's some habit that you used to have. So when you say something serves a purpose, you actually honor you honor the energy it used to give you. You honor the fact that you put something into it. And you also honor the fact that not everything is going to be in your life forever. And that's what allows you to let go. You start to let go when you realize that holding on to things is holding you back. And in particular, holding on to the guilt and the judgment that you layer onto yourself that you should, but I feel guilty, but this, but that, that is definitely holding you back from creating a new life and from creating space for something new to happen. And see, that's one of the reasons why you have to learn how to let go. Because when you continue to pour your energy 
into things that no longer give you energy back, it's going to kill you. It's going to kill your happiness. It's going to kill your vitality. It destroys your motivation. It makes you feel depleted. It makes you feel like you're the last on your list. And so that's reason number one. And the second reason why you have to start to let go of what doesn't serve you is because as long as you are holding on to the old stuff, you have no time, no space, and no motivation to create anything new, period. And you know this. How do I know if I'm getting used? And what do I do about it if I am? And we're going to start that process with a question from a listener named Crystal. Hey, Mel, it's Crystal, and I have a big question. How to know if you're being used? I have two adult siblings that have always lived with me. One has been unemployed for more than three years. Last week, my working sibling was placed on PIP. I've always been the big breadwinner, and they and my mom all lived in my home. My mom passed away four years ago. It's becoming increasingly difficult to motivate them and or get them to understand the weight of responsibility is on me. I'm beginning to think they don't care and are enjoying the stress-free lifestyle they've become accustomed to, or they don't understand because they've never had this type of responsibility. I'm growing tired of carrying all the obligation, accountability, and responsibility. When are they going to grow up and be equal contributors or move out? Thanks for any advice. This is really eating up bandwidth in my head. I will add we had a horrendous childhood and largely why we all stayed together. There is safety in numbers, and we had to have a united front against a very abusive father and ex-husband. He abused us all well into adulthood. Thanks for any insight. Thanks for all you do. Crystal, thank you for that question, and thank you for the detail that you provided in the end. I think that's really relevant to how you handle this and how you think about the situation that you're in, okay? So I've got five takeaways that I'm going to share with you. And the first one is this. There is a big difference between being used by somebody and being in a situation where somebody is used to the situation. Does that make sense? I'm going to unpack this a bit because I think it's really, really important. When you're being used That's a situation where somebody is intentionally using you or taking advantage of a situation to their benefit. They know they're doing it. For example, um, if you're uh, in a job and you've basically phoned it in and you're only staying there because you want the money, but you're not actually doing what's expected of you, you are using your employer. When you sneak stuff from your roommate's side of the refrigerator, you're using them. When you intentionally do something, like um, invite yourself to somebody's house, even though you don't like them, but they have a great pool and it's a nice weekend, but you are not that great of a guest or you don't really, you know, you gossip about them, you're using them. That situation is very different than what I think you're in, Crystal which is you're in a situation where the people around you are used to the situation. They've grown accustomed to it. They are comfortable in it. And what's happened is you're now not comfortable with the situation, but they're just used to it. And so I think it's important for you, Crystal, to anchor there. And as you are listening to me unpack all of these takeaways, I want you to apply this to your situation. Are you in a situation where you're being used because somebody's leading you on, but deep down they just want sex? And yet they're telling you that this is more, but they just want sex. That's a situation where you're being used. Or are you in a situation like Crystal where the situation's been like this for a while and everybody's kind of used to it, but you're just sick of it. So you now want to change it. And the details, Crystal, in your particular situation matter because you guys are used to living together. You guys are used to being under the same roof. You said that you've been doing this for a long time. Your mom used to live with you and that there's safety in numbers. And so I believe what's happened is that you are just tired of the situation the way that it is. 
And that means that you are going to be the one that changes it. Because if everybody else is used to it and they're comfortable in it, they have no motivation or no interest in changing it. Why would they? It's working for them. It's just not working for you. And that's okay. So the second takeaway, you ask the question, when are my siblings going to grow up? When are they going to realize I'm frustrated? When are they going to... Never. They are never going to grow up. Why? Because they're comfortable. They're used to this. They're used to you being in charge. You've always been in charge. You've always been the breadwinner. You said as much. And so they're not going to grow up. And that's okay, everybody. That's okay. That means that you are going to have to be the grown-up and you're going to have to parent. And I'm going to get to that. I'm going to tell you exactly what to do when you're in a situation where you're trying to make the people around you level up and help you change the situation. I also want to say for your sake, Crystal, and for anybody else that, you know, it sounds like you guys are all so struggling with trauma and PTSD. And so I know that that's also why you haven't shaken things up. If all three of you experienced horrific abuse, which you just said that you did, then you also have the added issue of people maybe not having healed from that trauma and maybe not being as proactive or as motivated or as self-sufficient as they could be. There was another detail in what Crystal said. She said PPI. What does that mean, everybody? It means a performance improvement plan. What that basically means is you're fucking up at work and your bosses have sat you down and they have said your work is not satisfactory and we are going to put you on a PIP, a performance improvement plan, which is very embarrassing. It's very confronting. It, I'm not making excuses for the sibling. I'm just trying to explain the psychology here of why they're not growing up and why they've gotten very comfortable with very low self-motivating standards. And you're now in this framework at work where you're being measured. And if you don't measure up, your ass is fired. A performance uh, improvement plan can be a really good thing because it means that they are providing a pathway for you to be able to excel, which means they believe that you can. But oftentimes when people are set up with a PIP, they feel so ashamed and embarrassed that they just quietly quit. They feel like the writing's on the wall. They feel unmotivated and self-conscious. 90% of people, when they get put on a performance improvement plan, leave the job. Whoa. It kind of makes sense because you feel like you've been called out and you're embarrassed. And so it's really important how you set up a performance improvement plan. Because if it's literally like you suck and you're going to get fired unless you do these things, who wants to stay at that job? But if you set it up using what is called the 19-word magic sentence, this is something that's been studied at like Yale and Stanford, when you say to somebody, I have high expectations of this team and I think you are capable of achieving them, which is why I'm going to put you on a performance improvement plan so that you know what's expected and I believe you can achieve this. This is the path forward for success for you. That is a way that makes you want to play the game. And so, Crystal, ironically, we're going to put your family, your siblings, on a performance improvement plan and we're going to set it up the right way. Because since it's your family, you can talk about your feelings and you can talk about your need to feel support and you can talk about um, these simple things that they can do that would make a huge difference in this living arrangement and in their lives and in your lives. So it can be like a really positive thing that you're going to do. So takeaway so far, you're either being used because it's conscious and intentional or you're just in a situation where people are used to what's going on and they're not motivated to change it like you are. When will other people grow up and realize this? Never. You got to be the adult in this situation if you want to change it because it's your life. It's your happiness. By the way, it's also your house and it's your responsibility to lead the change that you want to see. Always. Another takeaway that I want you to have is when you're around people that um, are not motivated to change their lives, you're probably dealing with what psychologists call learned helplessness. 
Now, learned helplessness was first coined in 1965 by a very famous psychologist after doing these really awful experiments with dogs. I'm not even going to explain the experiments. But basically, what learned helplessness is, is it's when you receive a series of setbacks or you are experiencing a lot of pain and you basically give up. You decide that there's nothing that you can do. It is what it is. And you just survive and try to cope through the pain and the situation. And it's the difference between being a person who is pessimistic, that you feel like nothing's ever going to change, you're never going to be good enough, why even bother? Boss never likes my work or... I never do well at work, or my sister already takes care of things, and I'm never going to amount up to anything, versus having an optimistic point of view. And optimism, realistic optimism, is just the belief that through your own actions and through your own attitude, you can make a positive dent in any situation, that your effort is always worth it, that trying is always worth it, that growth is available to you. And so I say this because when you're surrounded by people that have this sense that nothing they do matters, it just creates complacency and fear. And there's one thing that makes a difference when you're in this situation. And Crystal, I think that's the situation that you're in. You guys have past trauma. The situation has always been that you always take care of everything. Now you've got one of your siblings who's on a performance plan, so they're feeling kind of kicked down to the ground. And I would imagine there is this sense of pessimism. There is this sense of I'm just used to life not being easy. And that's where you can come in. And this is the fourth takeaway. You ready? They need goals. They need goals set by you. Goals for how they are supposed to show up. You see, they don't know the path forward. They don't know how it's supposed to look. You do because you want the situation to be different. And so it's on you to set what are called SMART goals. For those of you who have not heard about SMART goals, we will link to the article that was written in 1981 where three researchers came up with the idea of SMART goals in the context of leadership and business. But SMART goals is a very simple and effective way to think about setting goals for yourself or other people. SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And so here's how this is going to work with your siblings. I want you to think about how the situation could be different. Put on an optimistic hat. And now we're going to paint a picture of what it would look like in the day-to-day living situation so that you feel supported. Because it's not just about the money. Are they doing anything around the house? Are they cooking? Are they caring for the yard? When it snows, do they shovel? Are they taking the trash out on Mondays? Are they making their beds in the morning? Like, what is it that would make you feel as though the dynamic has shifted, that everybody's leveled up in their own achievable way, And those actions make you feel a shift, okay? And so let's go back to SMART, specific. What are specific goals you could set? And those goals might look like you need to make your bed every morning. Those goals might look like uh, I'm going to make a uh, grocery list. And every Tuesday, so-and-so is going to go to the grocery store. Uh, I'm going to create a schedule for who's cooking and who's doing dishes. And since you guys aren't contributing financially, that's what you're going to do. I know I'm being very kind of like annoyingly um, detailed here and maybe in a really um, condescending way. I don't mean to be. I'm trying to say that because people don't know what you want, which is what you should assume, and you're the one who wants the situation to be different, you have to get crystal clear, black and white, granular, meaning specific. I got to be able to measure it. It's got to be broken down so that your siblings can achieve it. It's got to be realistic, and it's got to be timely, meaning do it on a Tuesday, do it on a Wednesday, every weekend, I expect this, because that is how you lay a path forward 
for somebody who is in a hole to be successful. So the final piece, the fifth takeaway is this. When you see your siblings doing those actions, when you see them checking the boxes, when you see them making their bed, when you see them spending an hour every day looking for a job, or you see them checking in with you for 10 minutes every night about how work went today, when you see those actions happening, you got to cheer for them. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to create an environment where somebody knows that you believe in them, they know what your expectations are, they know the defined achievable steps that they can take in order to make you happy. And then when they do those things, you got to you gotta cheer for them. You got to say thank you. You got to say I appreciate you. And why this is so important is because you're not dealing with a situation, Crystal, where you're getting used. You're in a situation where you're trying to level up your siblings. And you're trying to do it when there's issues like generational trauma and hopelessness and patterns in place and a dynamic between all of you, which means you got to get super intentional about what the new game looks like. You got to define it. And then like an awesome coach always does, you got to cheer for your players as they are in that game. That's how you do this. Um, and I know you can do it because I can just tell based on your voice that you are somebody who is a very matter of fact, professional, successful, awesome person, which is why this is frustrating because we all think that everybody thinks like us. We all think that all those things that you think are obvious, why do you put your stuff on the floor? Why don't you just let the dog out? Why do you leave the dead flowers in the vase on the cake? Don't you just, we think it's obvious. It's not obvious to everybody, but you can make it obvious and you can make it a game worth playing. And don't forget, you get to talk about your feelings. Guys, I love you, but I feel frustrated and I'm starting to feel a little used and I'm starting to feel very sad because I see you guys just coasting in life and I believe that there's something more for you. And so here's my request. If you're going to continue to live with me, and I want you to, I need you to show up differently. And here is what I need from you. And I know you can achieve this. It would make a huge difference for me. And if you don't think you can do that, then maybe it's come to the point where we can't live together. But I need this support from you guys. And you might be surprised at how they show up if you frame it in the support that you need from them. It would probably feel really good to know that I could actually do something that my sister would appreciate and feel supported by instead of feeling like the one that's not successful. So I am in Salt Lake City and I'm about to give a speech. And as I landed uh, here in Salt Lake City, my phone, when it came back online, started to blow up. And it was text messages from our daughter, who is a senior in college. Her name is Kendall. And um, she is a music student. And she aspires to be a singer-songwriter. And that piece of information is important because it relates to the heartbreak, the confusion, and the entanglement issues she is going through. So what is the issue? The issue is she uh, was really interested in uh, somebody in her program. And they were collaborating as musicians. They were hooking up. They had a really fun relationship. They really cared about each other. And as these things do, it kind of fizzled out. And recently, there has been a new friend that has come into her life that's also a musician that has been extremely helpful in collaboration. And uh, Ken's all excited. And in fact, a week ago, she called me and said, you're never going to believe this. I met the coolest woman. She wants to do sessions together. She wants to work on music together. I feel so energized. And now Kendall's texting me because she found out a piece of information yesterday and it has rocked her world. So let me find, of course, I do not have this teed up for you. Uh, you can tell this is real time because I'm like, oh my God, I did not, I did not actually prepare 
because this is unfolding. Oh, here she goes. Okay, I found it. So at 11.43 a.m., my daughter texts me and says, Mom, I got to call you later. I found out some tea, and I'm hashtag sad. And then I said, let me guess, Brendan has a girlfriend. That's her high school sweetheart who they've both committed to marrying each other if they're both single still in their 30s. Is that it? Tell me the tea. I just got off a plane. She says, no, ha, 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 ha. Remember how I told you my friend wants to help me book sessions and do management stuff? Yep. And come on, you are a tease when it comes to this kind of stuff. Lay it on me. Sorry, I'm in class. Basically, it's a long story, but she now has a crush on... I'm going to make up a name because I don't um, want to disclose their names. Uh, she has a crush on... What name should we use, everybody? Steve. She has a crush on Steve. Steve? Do people name their kids Steve anymore? Steve. Okay. Basically, it's a long story, but she has a crush on Steve, and he has a crush on her because they've done a few sessions together because she needed help on a song she wrote for a class. And I just know that this is the universe giving me a test because the fact that she just waltzed into my life wants to be a bigger part of my life, and she just so happens to be now developing a crush on this boy I have history with and have made really good music with, this mom is not a coincidence. But I'll admit, I did have a big ugly cry last night because she's fucking gorgeous and they haven't even hooked up yet and he's already telling our friend <laughs> that he's crushing on this girl too. Like, bro, we hooked up for six months and he never said those words to <laughs> So now I just feel like he was only in it with me for the sex. Like, wow. Now, I have to give myself some props. I have been working on not trying to jump in and solve my kids' problems. This is so hard for me to do. My anxiety and my need to fix things and my need to make sure my kids are okay has me typically in this situation jump in and be like, here's what you need to do. And here, da, 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 da. But I have been working on using my own five-second rule, count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, put yourself in pause, and then I choose a different response. And my response now is to not correct a situation, but to seek connection. And so I put myself in pause. I'm so proud of myself for this. You've got to try this with the people in your life. And instead of offering a solution, I just offered connection and said, well, that fucking sucks. I hate it when the universe does that. And then she said, like, what am I supposed to make of this, mom? I put myself in pause. <laughs> I did not offer a solution. And I said, I don't know. What do you think you're supposed to make of this? Can we just say good job, Mel Robbins? Like, I feel like, okay, this is a huge leap in my parenting skills. She says, well... It almost feels like a test. And then I say, do you want me to tell you what I'm thinking? And she says, yes. And I said, I agree. I think it's a test about how serious you are about music. And then she says, it's also confusing because they're both so serious about music, which is why I think they're like into each other. And it's almost confronting for me in a way. And then I wrote, every relationship is a test. This one is saying, don't test me. I'm just fine on my own. Hey, wouldn't this be a great Lizzo song this moment? She says, I know, but this is just so unfortunate. I know that this is just the universe, Mom. All I have been manifesting is devotion to my work and music above all else. And clearly this is just a test of that manifesting because they are two people who want to help me make progress in my music career. And now that they could potentially get involved with one another, it's a test to try and shift my attention and question both of their roles. And if I actually want to collaborate and use them to help me with my music career. I've been trying so hard all day 
to have an abundant mindset. Like, good for them, honestly. How great it is that someone I want to produce and write with is also really dig someone that I want to support, that wants to support me, believe in me, and help me grow, you know? And then I said, I want you to also consider energy. She said, expand on that. I said, I will later. I think your energy is off now that this has happened. And this is not a good sign. She says, what do you mean? I said, well, it doesn't work for you to collaborate on music with someone you have weird vibes with. Now, I want to stop right there and unpack something for you. If you never, if you don't know what to do in life, always go in and pay attention to energy. When the energy shifts around people or relationships or anything that you're doing, that is always a sign about alignment. It's a sign for you to slow down when energy vibes shift and something feels off. As a human being, you are wired to be in alignment. You're wired to feel like things are in a groove. And clearly, when you find out news like our daughter did 24 hours ago, that somebody that you had been hooking up with and still have a crush on and still want to work with now has a crush on someone else and she has a crush on them, the energy is going to shift. And it's now an opportunity for you to learn something about yourself, for you to seek better alignment, and for you to follow the energy that feels good. That's the opportunity of a moment like this, which is why I brought up energy. Let's go back to the text exchange, okay? Mom, can you expand on that? I said, well, I will later, but your energy is off, and that's not a good sign. She said, what do you mean? I said, it doesn't work for you to collaborate on music, which is something very intimate for you, with someone you have weird vibes with. Have you ever had this situation happen to you, like at work, where you kind of had a crush on somebody at work, and next thing you know, you're finding out that the person you have a crush on with is actually secretly dating somebody else at work, and now you don't feel like you want to work on projects with those two? That's an example of that energy being off. And then she says, you mean the fact that my energy has been thrown by this means that it's not a good call. But mom, I also think that I can rise above this and be above this and let them do their thing without feeling threatened. Okay, let's stop right there. That is so true. What if you could develop the power and the self-awareness to notice in these kinds of heartbreaking and confusing situations that, boom, the energy's off. Oh, my God, I'm disappointed. I'm also confronted. What if you could literally switch gears in that moment? I mean, wouldn't that be a superpower to be able to rise above that kind of thing? And then she writes this. Well, I don't want to be with him anyway. I mean, I just don't. I just don't want him to want her. Mic drop. Isn't that life right there? And of course, I had to say, you know, that's a song. I know you hate it when I say that, but when I read your texts, I feel like I'm reading lyrics. Oh, okay. Right in the middle of this, my husband's calling. Okay, let's let me let me just pick it up real quick and let's see if Chris has to say. Did I just? Oh wait, I don't know what's happening. Is he still calling? Oh, here he is. Hold on. Hey, Chris. Hey, Mel. I'm uh, taping a podcast. What's up? I love you. I love you, too. Can I say something real quick? I'm talking about the the situation that Kendall has uh, with the uh, that guy she had been hooking up with for calling him Steve and her finding out that Steve has a crush on someone at school that is her good friend. Has she talked to you about this? This is a recent thing? Okay, so I guess you're in the dark. Yeah, I don't know anything. Okay. She's been trying to, she's been trying to call me, but I don't know if it's explicitly to tell me the story. I don't know anything about it, though. She probably is calling you to ask for money. <laughs> I think she's all set. I can see her. All right. Well, I'm going to hang up and keep talking to. But you're 
you're probably right that she's not calling me for relationship advice. She's blowing up my phone about it right now. So here's what I'm going to do. I love you too. I'm going to hang up with you. I'm going to continue talking to uh, the folks that are listening right now on the podcast. Do you want to say hi to everybody? Hey, everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, Christopher Robbins. There he is. Yay. Okay, well, you have a great day. I'll call you later um, because I'm about to lose my train of thought. Bye. Okay, so back to the podcast. That was Christopher Robbins. Isn't he cute? Um, okay, I think that's it. So here's what we're going to do. Um, I am going to try to get Kendall Robbins on the phone. Okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to get her on the phone. I have no idea how this is going to go. One thing I need you to know about this is that this is not staged and that I am going to try to bring you into my life but here's one boundary I need you to know as we start to do this on this show. We will never air something that either that features my kids or text messages or a friend or my husband without them listening to the episode and giving us the okay. I put that boundary in place because I want us to be able to record in a way that is spontaneous and authentic and live but all and and in that environment allow people to speak freely but also to have people know that they're safe to speak freely because nothing will air that they're uncomfortable with so it's important for me to tell you that so that you understand the steps that I'm taking um to both share my life and keep this real and raw and authentic and relatable and deeply personal and also not exploit people or make them feel unsafe. Okay, so let's see if we can get Kendall Robbins on the phone. She does not know that we are calling her. Here we go. For those of you watching on YouTube right now, I just want to tell you something. We taped what you're about to hear and watch yesterday, and the whole thing went down live. But when I opened yesterday, uh, I was all discombobulated. And so I'm in a different outfit than what you're about to see. And frankly, I don't even know how we're going to end this thing. So I might be in a different outfit <laughs> when you're watching this on YouTube. And that's one of the things why it's important to subscribe to YouTube, because we do release audio versions of the podcast and the unabridged behind the scenes, anything goes crazy ass stuff longer form is always released on the same day on YouTube. So you're going to want to listen to both. Okay. Um, anyway, that's it. So let's cut to us trying to get to Kendall. Um, here we go. Hi, this is Dr. Schneeberger, Kendall's grandfather. If your boy hang up, Otherwise, leave a message. At the tone, please record your message. She has had that voicemail message that my dad recorded for her since she was in ninth grade. I got to give her props for having the same outgoing message that your grandfather recorded. I mean, for eight years. Come on now. If you can roll with that through high school and college, you can roll through somebody crushing on your ex crush. That's all I'm saying. And you can also get the message in all of this mess of your life that what is hurting you is probably not meant for you, that it's time that you align your life with a new direction that energizes you and people that you're in a groove with. It's really that simple. People come and go in your life. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to be stung when they exit, because when that door slams, sometimes your finger can get caught in it. You know what I'm saying? So let's see if she calls us back. She's in class. She just texted me, mom, mom, I'm in class. What's your problem? Uh, we'll fi she'll find out what my problem is when she calls back. And hopefully we'll be able to air it. You answer it. Just hit. Kendall? Oh. Kendall? Hi. Hi. Okay. So I thank you for calling me back after class. I wanted to talk to you about the texts 
that we were exchanging today because it reminded okay. what are you doing i'm eating a chocolate bar mom like sorry i don't have a fucking podcast mic on me right now okay i'm ready go america will wait no the yeah, globe will because there we have listeners and fans around the world hanging on your every world word and the crumbs coming out of that chocolate bar Mm, they're good crumbs. Are you like inside? Can you go outside where maybe we can hear you? I am outside. Can you move away from those annoying people sitting next to you? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Talk to me. Okay. While I'm moving. Talk to you while I'm moving. Okay. So I um, got your text today and I shared uh, the gist of it with everybody. And oh, yeah. after sharing the gist of it with everybody, I um, thought, wow, it reminded me of a moment when I was going through a really hard time and there was a bunch of my life, a bunch of things in my life that were not working the way I'd hoped they would. And you gave me some of the best advice I have ever received. Do you remember what it was? I do. What was it? Um, well, I told you that the reason that you were experiencing that, whatever you were experiencing, which was not a pleasant experience, was so you could get back in touch with what the people you're trying to inspire are struggling with every day because you're a very lucky person. You worked very hard for the life that you have, but I think you on a day-to-day basis don't really struggle the way that the people you inspire do. And I told you that the reason that you were having all these issues was because you needed to be reminded of how they feel and how you had once felt. And if we go a level deeper and more profound on the advice. Okay what force was actually giving me those lessons? What what was? What force? Because in your advice, there's a presumption about something bigger and more profound. So talk about that. The universe. Well, should I talk more descriptive of my own personal experience? Well, when you gave me that advice, because it's easy to give advice, right? because you're not emotionally attached to the situation. Yeah. And so when you gave me that advice, that the reason why these things were happening in my life that were hard and challenging and causing me a lot of pain and causing Mm -hmm. me to question people Mm -hmm. around me and what was happening, you basically said that, Mom, your biggest mission in life is to help people. That's how you started. And because of your success, you have gotten far away from what it feels like to wake up every day and feel this level of struggle. That there was a there was something in this challenge tied to my purpose and mm-hmm. that a greater spiritual force and energy was behind this if I was willing to look at the challenge that way. Yeah. Do you believe that? No. I mean, I think it's also like has a lot to do with um, like growth and like comfort and like wanting to, I don't know, because I think like you and me are both inspired by and want to create things that require us to grow and to challenge ourselves every day. And it's so easy to just stay in like a comfortable place to stay and stay in all the habits that you have to never do shit that scares you. And I, or never do, never interact with people or things or relationships that make you look in the mirror, make you feel insecure, make you scared or make you angry or whatever it is. And I think that you that that like challenge tie that you experienced was like, I don't know. I think for me right now, I'm sort of in this place where I'm trying to, I'm going through a 
teeny little fucking challenge tide that's like basically a fucking tide pool like it's not a tsunami yeah <laughs> yours was mine was not but <clears throat> i think i'm going through this challenge tide and i'm trying so hard because i want to ta- maintain because i want to maintain feeling aligned and because i want to embrace growth and not let this derail me that I'm like trying so hard to stay in like a mindset where I look at it as like an opportunity instead of like something that's been put something like I'm being damned I'm being wrong like it's more of like okay you know what thank you this is some sort of message what is the message so so because let's go back to this part where you get the news that somebody that you are a new friend with is now crushing on somebody you used to crush with and, yeah, and and this new this new friend has come into my life and asked if they can pour it to me basically professionally, which is like a, an absolute godsend. And then I find out like a few days later that it's like there's some entanglement between someone that I used to feel something for and now they might feel something for them, but I still want to utilize this new friend. It's just, I'm just playing chess. Maybe I'm playing checkers. I don't know. I don't really know how to play What's either What's the one. difference? <laughs> I don't either. Well, I, I think I know how to play checkers, but... I'm, I'm probably playing checkers, let's be honest. Well, I think that you're at a crossroads. But, but what, what my point is, is that it would be so easy for me to just drop a fucking bomb on this really cool person and this really cool opportunity I have with not only the the ex but the new person who's going to help me and the ex who by the way I also deeply deeply respect and care about and know in my heart that I'm not supposed to be with and I'm not supposed to have a relationship to but I think now that he and her are now entangled it's making me go wait I kind of want him to be entangled with me again, which is not what I want. It's just my whole, this is my like fear of rejection coming up and my ego coming up. But back to my point is like, it would be so easy for me to just fucking derail this whole thing because I'm insecure and I'm suddenly feeling like I'm in a place of resistance. And Stop it would be right harder there. Stop for right me. there. And, Can I just ask a question? Mm-hmm. Can you explain to me? What exactly you would do to derail this situation? What would the old, I mean, sneaky, nasty you well, do? Well, I would, I would probably just find ways to, like, I would probably start to avoid her. I would probably, like, pull the, pull the plug. Not, not pull the plug, but, like, sort of just pump the brakes on this, like, relationships that this relationship that I'm cultivating and in this relationship that I'm like actively pouring more time into I would probably pump the brakes on that would you then like pull the string again on the person you used to be interested in would I what on him would you stoke the flame on the person you used to be interested in again that would be like level zero Kendall because I'm not really somebody that does that after a breakup but (laughs) <laughs> Maybe I might, I, I'm more of like a cold shoulder person. Like you don't exist. I don't exist, which is not really a great tactic. Is that either, like a level two? No, I mean, I, like, I think what I would do is I would pump the brakes on her. And every time I would around, I was around him, I'd shut down. I would not collaborate with him. I would not collaborate with her and by, and, and then do it. And, I would just feel myself in a place of resistance, in a place of shut down, in a place of like, like I would just go to a really horrible, horrible, like detrimental, negative self-talk place that probably wouldn't be lifted for a while. You're, you're, you're basically describing me, and like, listen, me, listen, I, like I, in my I, like ten, I, my teens and twenties, and sometimes my thirties. But go ahead, and sometimes my forties. But well, what I was gonna say is like when I found out about this. Which How did you find out? Uh, that's not important. I found out. 
And when I found out about this, which happened quite literally yesterday, all, all of last night and like slivers of today, I felt myself in that place. Like not really like acting, not really acting out from that place, but like in that mindset of like looking in the mirror and being like, wow, I'm fucking ugly or being like, Ooh, she's so much better than me. No wonder he wants her. Like, there's no way I can collaborate her because of this. There's no way that he's ever going to want to collaborate with me. Like things are going to be awkward just like over and over and over and over and over. And then like, I had to remind myself, like, we're not doing that. We're not going to be, we're not going to like live there. We're not going to be in that mindset. Like yada, yada, yada. But like it's day it's pretty much day one and I'm like already having to sort of like train my train myself to like not go there. Can I ask you a question? Sure. Cause I think this is so incredibly relatable and mm-hmm. what I visualize when I think about you standing on a street corner and having the thought cross your mind or seeing them talking or having a text show up from one of them because y'all are kind of collaborating in a professional sense. Yeah. That you now literally find yourself at an emotional and mental crossroad. The text or seeing them or a song coming on triggers you to be at the crossroad and the Kendall Zero goes down the left-hand road and has negative thoughts that basically beat the hell out of you and tell you a story. See, more evidence. See this. And the Kendall, what number are we going to assign this? Fucking 100. Okay, Kendall fucking 100. Who then looks at the other fork, which is a fork that's aligned with what you actually want, with who you're becoming, with energy that is in a groove that matches with you. And that's a whole new way of thinking and being for you. Yeah. What's this been like? And what would, what it, since you're actively in this, what would you, how would you describe what people need to do who are, in this situation they're literally just found out that their ex is going on a date with their friend they just found out that um the dream job that they got or the dream school that they wanted to be in went to somebody else and there's this moment where the way you thought things were going to go just don't happen and you feel the sting that you're talking about. And it just causes you to start telling yourself a very old story. It's never going to work out for you. This always happens to me. Nobody's going to love me. You know, when is it going to be my turn? All that crap. How does somebody in that moment actually visualize a fork in the road, start to catch that negativity, and redirect themselves in a new direction okay well one second i'm just getting on my bike okay do we have to ride while we're giving the world advice here i think that you forget that i'm a student and i'm living my life so give me a second this is good you can cut this out like (laughs) relax jesus (sighs) ah What I was going to, well, okay, well, I'm sort of just going to start talking and I might contradict myself and I might go back on what I'm saying, but I guess that's part of this whole thing. But, oh, yeah, I'm driving up to Thornton and potential encounter oh, about to happen. That would no. be amazing. <laughs> I'm going to manifest that right now. Dear God, please. Come on, bring them in, bring them in. I would no, no, like no, no, to see no, the no, two no. of them walk around the corner as you're talking to us. No, 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 they're not. Um, if they did, no, but, where would you feel it? I would be like, damn it, that blows. But, but then I would tell myself, like, I think I just, I think what I tell myself is I'm like, 
Well, I think that it helps for me. It, it, it helps to know that, like, in my certain situation, like, I've, I've already, like, done it, and I've already tried it, and it didn't work. And I, like, I know in my heart, like, I think what you need to do in these kinds of situations is just, like, remember what you know to be true, like, in your heart. Like, if it's your dream school and you didn't get in then and your best friend did, like, just believe in the fact that it's still your dream school and it's going to happen. It just might not be right now. And I think for me, what I'm telling myself is, like, I don't want that relationship. I don't want to be in that relationship. And I know that in my heart. And, like, instead of torturing myself and going back to, like, my old ways of thinking and trying to tell myself that I do want it just so I can have some sort of stupid validation, I'm going to tell myself that, like, he's he's still here. He's still talking to one of my good friends now, maybe for a reason. And instead of seeing this as, like, a detriment to my life, like, why don't I just flip the fucking script and, like, benefit from it? Like, how cool would it be if two people who... I know care about me who respect me deeply and who both want to pour into me creatively and professionally. How, how fucking amazing would it be if they both fucking love each other and are vibing and are awesome and how great is, is it and how good and great does it feel to visualize like them hitting it off and them crushing on each other and them being awesome and great and just like an explosion of love and light and I just get to experience that and I get to be around that and I get to benefit from that and like I think I don't think you were that into him if you're this transformed 24 hours later I'm just gonna put it out there like this sounds like a highly evolved human being no it is and I also don't I think that like some like a non-aligned human would probably listen to me talk and be like well that's fucking selfish like because I'll tell you what what you just said there was exactly the point of this, which is... I was going to say, it's it's all about healthy selfishness in this situation. Like, I, I know in my heart that, like, what I want is not that. And so instead, let me just surrender to the reality of what it is and then flip the script and be like, how can I have fun? How can I, how can I make this fun for me? How can I use this to benefit me? Like, how can I like look at this in a way that's like not going to make me feel like shit? I think that's amazing. And since you're on a roll, can I ask you one more question? Sure. The fact that you've processed this in less than 24 hours and you're already love and light and alignment to me says you weren't that into him anyway. And these are old wounds that you're working on around rejection. Or, or it says that, I was and I'm mature as shit and I'm on my spiritual awakening journey and I'm a light I'm aligned. That you can How about that? I think that's freaking hot. That's No, like fuck though you weren't that into him. Like no, I really was, but I'm more into myself and I'm on my fucking journey and what of it? Oh my god. Okay, so I just got something from this and now my armpits are sweating cuz it's such a good idea. You ready? Sure. You are able to hyper process this because you are very clear about who you are and what it feels like when you're in the groove with energy and people and where you put your attention. Mm -hmm. And it is very clear when you are in alignment with your energy, with your focus, with who you surround yourself with, when something enters the space that's off. You feel friction. Yes. You don't feel like yourself. You feel yourself reaching for old toxic behaviors. Yes. And, yes. and that's why you were able to process this so quickly and hold space for the fact, I still like the guy. And I still want to work with her and him. And so him. I got to figure this out because what the universe is actually teaching you, Ken, is it's teaching you how to stay laser focused on your higher objective Instead of getting sucked into the toxic bullshit that Kendall Zero used to get sucked into. Yeah, 100%. I love that. Yeah, that, that's, that, that feels very, like, clear and, like, makes sense to me. Because it's like, I don't want to lose them. I don't want to lose, like, what I was saying about the whole derailing thing is, like, it would be so easy for me to just, like 
derail okay not working with you not working with you i'm gonna go cry about it i'm gonna listen to fucking sad music and blah 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 blah, and miss this crazy good opportunity or i could win from this like it's just it's just the mindset of being like i can win from any situation okay well that's a little that's a little provincial but but actually can i think it's a good it's a good mindset to have like any situation that you are in whether or not you put yourself there if you did if you didn't if it was placed upon you like you can still win and like it's just about like figuring out that higher objective and figuring out how you can feel aligned in that in that negative in that space that uh, initially felt pretty negative one final thought one final thought if we were to roll the clock back two and a half years when you went through something way more painful that took a lot longer to process. I know exactly what you're talking about. (laughs) Do you have any insight to offer for somebody who's in that space, who thinks what you're saying right now sounds absolutely fantastical and completely not realistic? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that, that's, give me a second on that one. Not like a day, like give me actually five seconds. Can I offer something? Sure. What if, if you take your mindset of, I could win in this, that there are certain upsets along the way that take longer to process? Okay, I have it. Go. I was just going to say that like, Everybody always says, like, you can't love anyone until you love yourself. But I feel like that, like, the word choice in that isn't correct. Because I feel like if I had known at that point two years ago when I was going through a much more painful and drawn out and confusing, entangled breakup, like, I had no, like, I didn't really believe that, like, I didn't believe in myself. Like at that point in time, I wasn't like, I was put on this earth to do something bigger. Like I, I, I didn't like actually believe with my whole heart that like I was put on this earth to live an incredible life and that I had the power to do so. And like, I think that's where a lot of people's issues are is that like, they just, they don't think that they're worth it. They don't think that they can actually achieve their dreams. They don't have dreams. Like, you know what I mean? And it's like, at that point in time, I, I had ideas of what I thought my dreams were but they they weren't real and I didn't actually believe like I'm doing I'm gonna be doing something bigger than this like this is just like a a piece to the puzzle it's not the puzzle itself and I feel like right now I can actually taste like the bigger things that are gonna be happening for me and like I can feel that like and, and because I can taste it I know that this small challenge tide is just a test, you know, and it's not the whole thing. And it's, and and it's, I can, I can easily compartmentalize it because I can taste the bigger picture, but like I had to do a lot of fucking taste testings before that. You know what I mean? Like go to the winery, babe. I love that. And I would add one more thing. You're able to process this entanglement in hyper freaking star wars like whatever speed like i just see hyper speed because of everything that you allowed yourself to feel and learn and process and mourn and discover about yourself in that painful year of breaking up just like i am able to feel a level of contentment and happiness that I've never experienced in my life now that I'm 53 because of the protracted, painful, awful, horrible two years of heartbreak that you had a front row seat to. Yeah. And I think the breakthrough that you receive in life is in direct reverse proportion to how painful the experience was. And yeah, when you get any But I don't think that that I don't think that that is is widespread and that isn't like a way to seek 
I don't recommend you smash into a wall to learn a lesson. I'm saying life no. does that to you. And yeah, if you are totally. able to process the hard stuff as a lesson, one of the benefits is the second the future you gets within an inch of anything that feels familiar to that old pain, you have an opportunity to go, oh, 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 I'm at that crossroad. I see the old me. I could spend a year doing this bullshit where I suck my thumb in the corner and I play small and I pretend my life is over and I hate every other woman because they're prettier. Or yeah, uh-huh. I know that road. Or you actually put yourself in park and say, wait a minute. I learned something from that. And what I learned is I'm not fucking doing that again to myself. I'm going yeah, to. And I also think that like, I also think like for this example, especially with this like girl and this guy, like I think like even yesterday and today I felt a little bit of like, oh, well maybe like this, maybe that road that they're on is like the wrong one. Like maybe I'm like, oh, well maybe I should like, I'm like visualizing a lot of like going left and going right and like, the, for some reason, the right is always, like, the right road to go down. I mean, I don't think that was a coincidence in my brain. But what I'm saying is, like, t yesterday I was like, you know what? Maybe, like, collaborating with both of these people is not go is, is, is going to the left. It's not going to the right. And, like, I, sh I shouldn't I shouldn't be go I shouldn't be collaborating with them. Like, this is not a good idea. But then I was like, no, because if I wasn't collaborating with them, then I would actually be going to the left because I would be, like, in resistance and I would be in pain and I would be comparing myself to every other woman on the face of the fucking earth. You know what I mean? It's like, yes. Con consider that you don't do that and then see which road you're on. Amazing. Hold that thought. I just want to ask, uh, Andrea and Maddie and, uh, Jesse, do you have any question you want me to ask Kendall? No, Maddie, you got one. I was like, Maddie was crying. I'm think I was crying because what you said. No, well, what you said is exactly what I've been going through, like literally right now, um, and what I went through, like I think almost three and a half years ago, when I went through like a really prolonged, drawn out breakup where I felt like I wasn't good enough to be in the relationship and I wasn't enough to be enough for you know what he wanted. When that wasn't the case. Um, and it's taken me a really long time to get to the other side of it. And I think that what you said is so, and I'm like, I'm still probably like not close to, I'm like, I'm getting there, but I'm not quite there. You know what I mean? Like it, it just takes time. And I wonder maybe like, I like the question of like, what would you tell your past self? But like, not even what could you take away? It's just like, if you could place yourself in a space yeah. in this moment where you feel the exact same way that you felt at that time like you you know that you would make a different decision right yeah I think honestly like if I was in that like really hard like cyclical bad pattern what I would do is just like every day do like a little something that scared me or do like every time that I felt like just that like shit mindset I was going back to like every time I felt myself going back to it like just toy with the idea or like welcome the idea of doing the other thing you know what I mean because that's just like sort of building the muscle like strengthening the muscle of like going to the right instead of the left like because for me in that really long breakup it was like I was in the same place like I'm not good enough for him like he's but I'm never going to be good enough for him and now I've gotten to a point where I'm like it is a fucking gift that I was even with him and it is a gift that it didn't work out and like it's not it had nothing to do with me not being good enough to him it was just like he was a part of my journey and like he served his purpose and I knew all along it wasn't supposed to be like a lifetime but I think it, I resisted going to the right for so long, like to the point where literally like there was a fucking roadblock, like the road fell apart, the left road fell apart. And it was like, I don't have a choice. You know what I mean? And so I think what would, what my piece of advice would be is to like practice just like turning right a little bit here and there every day, just go to the right. Oh, I normally would do this, but let me just try doing that. Or I normally would think this, but let me just try thinking that. And I honestly think that like that will help you strengthen the muscle because the amount of resistance I was in for so long 
going to the left, going to the left, going to the left when the universe was like, go to the fucking right was just like a waste of time. And now I know that like, if I just practiced trying to do the other thing, think the other way, like it would have been so much easier for me to see like the strung along pattern that had been being created for me all along. Well, I think it's interesting. Like the fact that you say go to the left and go to the right, because I think that you can take that in so many different directions. Like something that my dad has always told me is like, always like choose yourself first and I've never done this right like I I always put others in front of myself and like I always put others feelings and others situations and how other people you know react to what I do before what I think about my actions and so I think it's interesting because turning left to me when you said it I was like that feels like choosing everybody else and turning right feels like choosing me yes 100 percent that's it's it. like you That's always great. know what like you should be doing for you but it's like scarier to do that or you don't want to do that because it might fuck up what's going on with everyone else but the second you start putting you first it's like it's just like a trickle down effect like you start attracting more shit to just start happening for you and it's incredible it's so interesting that you say that because I recently started doing those kinds of things and I literally see a shift in my behavior and how other people like react to my behavior like the confidence Mm -hmm. that I have based on choices that I've made in the last six months alone has been completely different than the confidence I had even a year ago that like I can make decisions now today that I couldn't that I I know I couldn't have made a year ago and it's because of totally choices of like turning right and choosing me instead of doing things for other people and doing things for the benefit of other people instead of doing them for the benefit of me yeah Totally. Good on you, man. Good okay, on mom, you. I, I'm literally class starts in one minute, so I do have to leave. But I love you very much. And let's talk after class. I love you. I'm proud of you, actually. I'm proud of the person you're becoming and your ability to share everything that you're learning through all of it with all of us. I'm proud of me too. Like I've come a long fucking way. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, oh, like yeah. it's, it's like laughable <laughs> but I'm like I'm like just happy and I'm like grateful that I can like be this mindful about myself and like I'm finally like manifesting and attracting and like doing things that I've always like wished I could you know I love it well we'll keep sharing and unpacking it so everybody else can learn along the way too I am right here shoulder to shoulder with you in this same struggle okay I'm 54 years old I thought by the time I was 54 years old, my life would be a party. There would be barbecues every weekend. We'd be going on cruises and bike trips with friends. I'd have all kinds of downtime to hang out with my buddies. What the hell has happened? <laughs> it's like the, I, I feel like the older I get, the more boring I get. I feel like adult friendship. This is how I would summon. This is how I would describe adult friendship, at least for Mel Robbins. And I'm sure you can relate to this. Adult friendship is literally bumping into people randomly and being like, oh, my God, it's so great to see you. We should get together. And then six months go by. And I know we kind of relate to that and we can laugh at it. But here's the thing I keep reminding myself. And I want to put this pin in it, too, for you. You ready? You're friends and you actually mean it when you say we should get together. But there's something that's standing in the way of us actually doing it. And I'm going to tell you what it is. It's these five damn lies. Because these lies are keeping you from doing the simple things that help you create adult friendships. And these lies also make you feel horrible. And these lies also make you and keep you lonely. And so we're going to pack them all. And uh, I want you to just get a couple simple takeaways, okay? You and me were friends. And you're not the only one that feels this way. And there are simple things that both you and I can do that we don't feel like doing that will fix this problem in our life. And it is a problem because friendship is so important and having fun is important and you deserve to feel connected to cool people and you are a cool person and so am I. And so I'm going to make sure after we unpack these lies, you have three simple tools to turn this puppy around, okay? Because that's what I want for you and it is certainly what I want for myself. So lie number one, lie number one that you're telling yourself, everybody's life is a huge party. It, that is such bullshit, okay? We have all gotten sucked into the fake life on social media. Everybody's life is not a huge party, okay? Unless you live in a sorority or a fraternity, 
your life is not a huge party, okay? And even if you live in a sorority or fraternity, you may be lonely. You may not like the people that you're surrounded by. And so stop telling yourself this lie that everybody else's life looks like a huge party. And here's why you need to stop telling yourself this lie. It's so damaging because when you sit there and you compare where you're at to people's fake lives on social media, you are comparing yourself to something that's not true and you are invalidating your own life experience. And let me just stop and let's role play here. How is sitting on your couch scrolling through social media? Oh, they're going on vacation together. Oh, look at that nice bike trip. Oh, those people docked together for a bachelorette party. Oh, everybody's life is a party but mine. How does that make you feel? Does that make you feel excited to text the friends that you have? Probably not. What does it do? It puts you in a mental death spiral that makes you start to swirl the toilet of comparison it makes you feel like a loser. It makes you feel left out. And yet you probably spend an hour a day on social media just staring into the lives of strangers and convincing yourself that everybody's life is a party except for yours. No one's life is margaritas in Ibiza. That may be what influencers do, but that's not what normal people do. And the reason why you have to stop telling yourself this lie is because you will never feel motivated to make the effort and you will never feel worthy of the kind of friendships you deserve if you are constantly swimming in the toilet of comparison. So what is the truth? What do you need to do to turn this around? Truth number one, if you want your life to be a party, create it. That's truth number one. You know, I'm guilty of this too. I'm guilty. I, I always know when I'm coaching myself because I go, that's number one. I always raise my voice because I'm also kind of trying to get you to listen, but I'm also like, hey, Mel, stop looking at everybody else and saying, there's the party. Why am I not invited? And look in the mirror. If you actually want that for yourself, create it. I remember there was a period in my life where my business was really taking off and I was on the road all the time. And it was also that moment in time when... Um, our kids had gone from middle school into high school. And something interesting happens when you are in that area of your life where you are raising kids. And so as you listen to me tell this story, you can think about it from the lens of being an, an adult and raising kids. Or if you don't have kids and you're in your 20s, you can think about friendship from the same lane. Because, you know, when you are raising kids or when you're a young kid, you travel in packs. Everybody's at the same soccer thing. You tend to hang out with people after, uh, you know, soccer's on Saturdays. Your parents are friends with the, with the kids that you, the parents of the kids you hang out with. And then something interesting happens around middle school. Kids start to peel off into club sports. You start to have uh, your own preferences of friends and the friend group starts to fracture. And when high school rolls around and you have more independence you now can drive or you can get rides with your friends. You are on your own. And that huge friend group that you used to travel with, it sort of shatters. And you only see people kind of at games or at big events. And for me, I, it was happening at the same time. My career's taking off. I'm traveling all the time. We're now in high school, so there's not that large organizing thing that happens when you're younger as a kid and when you have young kids. And... I started to realize I wasn't seeing my friends. Where did all my friends go? And I started to swim in the toilet of comparison. I would get home at the end of the week from work and I would look on social media and I would see people out at the country club that we didn't belong to posting photos and I would see other groups of people. Maybe it was people who had sons on the same soccer team, but our daughters, you know, were hanging out with it and they're getting together. And I started to convince myself everybody's life is a big party. And this is why this lie is so damaging. You tell yourself you're not invited to the party. You start to feel like a loser that nobody likes. And I felt that way for a couple of years. And finally, one day I said to Chris, like, we just don't get invited anywhere. And Chris turned to me. It's so interesting. And he said, when's the last time we invited anybody over? Mic drop. Thank you, Chris Robbins. If you want your life to be a party, 
Start throwing them. And stop telling yourself the lie that the party is somewhere else and you haven't been invited. Create your own. So that's truth number one, okay? Truth number two is this. If you're swimming in that toilet of comparison and you're telling yourself everybody's life is a party but mine and you feel like a loser, I want to tell you something. You don't need a lot of friends. This is a huge myth that I think that modern life has slammed in our face thanks to social media because now we're aware of what everybody else is doing. The truth is, and this is based on research, that you don't need a huge group of friends. If you got one or two really close friends, I'm talking the kind of friendship that runs deep in terms of trust. If you have what researchers call a 4 a.m. friend, what is a 4 a.m. friend? A 4 a.m. friend is somebody in your life that if you called them at four o'clock in the morning, just because you wanted somebody to talk to, they would pick up. I want you to stop and think for a minute. Let's say that you wake up at four o'clock in the morning and there's nothing really wrong. It's not like you have an emergency because I think in emergencies, there's lots of people you can call. But let's just say it's four o'clock in the morning and you wake up, can't go back to sleep. You're feeling kind of lonely. You just want somebody to talk to. Who would you call? For me, I know I, I would call Jody, Jody Bricken. She's my best friend from elementary school. She has trouble sleeping. She's probably awake anyway. Hi, Jodes. And she would pick up. I would call Amy. Amy is sitting right across from me right now. I could absolutely call Amy. I, I can think of a couple people. I would call Gretchen Larkin. I would call Lisa Schwartz. There are a bunch of people in my life I could call. So I'm doing okay. If there was one human being that popped into your mind that you could call at four o'clock in the morning, and I know there is, you are doing okay. And I also have a confession to tell you. As much as I am jealous of what looks like huge parties, and as much as I am the kind of person that thinks she wants to always be at a huge party, the truth is I'm very extroverted in my work, but I'm really introverted in my personal life. And I think it's important for you to hear, it's okay if you're not the big girl gang or guy gang type of person. There's nothing wrong with you if you just prefer to run in a small circle. Now, I think my circle has gotten so small, it's basically become a dot because of COVID, but we're going to get into that when we get into some of the other lies. But I need to say that loud and clear. It is a lie that everybody's life is a huge party. That's number one. And the truth is, if you want a party, start throwing one. And the other truth is, you don't need to have a huge group of friends. You know, I often think about the fact that, you know, some really fun memories that you'll have is with an enormous crowd of people. Like think about being at a huge wedding, right? The band is playing, you're dancing like crazy. It's super fun. You're surrounded by family. You got some friends there. All the friends that you go out and party with, are any one of them your 4 a.m. friend? Probably not. Probably not. And we're going to get into this as we talk about the other four lies that you keep telling yourself. So let's keep going. Lie number two sounds a little like this. I don't fit in. Or maybe you say this to yourself. People don't like me. That's me. You want to know what is going on in the Mel Robbins head here? It's people don't like me. Or another way I would say this, you're mad at me. I just presume I've done something wrong. That's how, that's how screwed up my wiring is. I'm working on this, as you know. And so I'm going to continue confessing how this uh, plays out in my life. Because I know you look at me and you're like, you think people don't like you? But you are like the most confident person on the planet. Like you, the, the, you show up, you roll into a room and things are on fire, Mel. Like, I, I don't, I, what do you mean? What I project is very different than what the voice in my head is programmed to say. And that's why it's a lie. My voice in my head tells me a lie. And the voice in your head is telling you a lie too. Here's how this plays out for me. I am the kind of person that is always trying to read people's emotions. I wonder if people are upset with me. In fact, I don't even wonder if people are upset with me. I just presume that they are. I'm the type of person that would put emojis 
behind any kind of text if I feel like that might be taken in the wrong way or might hurt somebody. And here's what I'm learning from the Mel Robbins podcast as we interview these experts and as I dig into your stories and DMs with you, is that this is complete tomfoolery. It's not true. This is garbage from my childhood. This is attachment theory stuff. Clearly, I have an insecure attachment style. If I'm constantly worried, clearly I've got coping mechanisms and wiring that I developed when I was little that I don't want anymore as an adult. And so why is this lie so damaging? People don't like me. Well, let's role play this one. If you're sitting at your house or in your car or scrolling on social media and you're telling yourself the lie, I don't fit in. People don't like me. On a scale of zero to 10, how motivated are you to put yourself out there? How about negative 27? That's how motivated you are. You are not only not motivated, you are more likely to hide. Because if you believe, because of this lie you've been telling yourself, that people don't like you, why on earth would you put yourself out there? This is why I need to shake both of us by the shoulders. This is why we got to start reaching for the truth. This is why we've got to combat this awful programming that tells us the lie that people don't like you. It's not true. And I'm not just saying that because I like you. I'm not just saying that because I know you're a good person. I'm saying it because there is research around this. It's called the liking gap. And this research uh, hold on to your hats, people. This comes from psychologists at Cornell, Harvard, Yale. So we're talking smarty pants research here. This means we got to believe it, okay? It's called the liking gap. What is the liking gap? It's this lie. It's the tendency to underestimate how well liked you really are. See, you feel awkward about reaching out, and so do I due to this liking gap. We don't reach out because we don't think people like us. We're underestimating the truth. What's the truth? People like you. Period. Nobody's mad at you. Period. Stop living your life as if somebody's mad at you. How about, how about we flip this instead? How about you start living your life assuming that people like you? What a radical idea. What a radical idea to walk into work and say to yourself, people like me here. What a radical idea to walk into a party this weekend or to a networking event and go, people like me here. I mean, that is a revolutionary idea. And I, I will tell you something. I struggle with this. I struggle with this a lot. This is one that, that I'm really working on in my own life. And I'm telling you this because I want you to work on it. And I'm going to confess something. Boy, this is really turning into like a, a therapy session. I wish you were really sitting here so you could hold my hand. Um, so when I was launching the Mel Robbins podcast, I uh, was told that the best way to grow a podcast show is to be interviewed on other podcast shows. I mean, it's kind of obvious, right? And here's the truth. I have a lot of friends that host podcasts that are really successful podcast hosts. Jay Shetty, Lewis Howes, Jenna Kutcher, Amy Porterfield, Koya Webb, Glow Antonimo, um, The Bill Hughes. The list goes on and on and on. And when I was getting ready to launch this, I was telling myself this lie. People don't like me. If I reach out, it's a burden. You know, because if you are hesitant to ask for support, it's because you're telling yourself deep down this lie that somebody doesn't like you or that they're going to be mad at you or burdened by you. And I am telling you that I struggle with this. And so there were a couple friends of mine, Jay and Lewis and the Bill Hughes and Rich Roll, that all said, hey, and the boss babes, they said, hey, I'd love to have you on the show. And I didn't reach out to anybody else. Do you want to know why? Because of this lie. Because there was a part of me that was like nervous that when somebody received a text from me, even though these are my friends, I was trapped in the liking gap, which in my opinion is like another toilet we swirl in. We swirl in this toilet of comparison and now we're also in the toilet of 
do you like me? No, actually, I've decided that you don't. And here's something kind of wild, because life gave me a really important lesson. So the show launches, and we just explode in terms of popularity. And within a week, we've got half a million downloads, and we're on the top of the charts. And I got a text from a very good friend of mine, Brendan Bouchard, somebody who has helped me in some of the worst moments of my life. He is just a gem of a human being. Please check him out. He's awesome. In fact, he just launched a uh, killer marketing podcast. If you're in business, I would check that sucker out. He texted me. And he said that I thought twice about texting this to you, but have I done something wrong? And when I read that, I my heart sank. I'm thinking, why does he think he's done something wrong? And he said, I saw that a bunch of our mutual friends were supporting your podcast launch and you didn't ask me. And it stopped me in my tracks because there's a reason why I didn't ask him. He was launching a podcast network at the same time. And he had helped me so profoundly with the High Five Challenge and Growth Day. And I felt like I just couldn't burden the guy anymore. Why? Because I was telling myself a freaking lie. What's the lie? That people don't like me, that I'm a burden, that I can't ask for help. It's complete garbage, everybody. In fact, when you don't ask your friends to support you, they feel like your life is a party and they're left out. Isn't that unbelievable? We're all sitting there swirling in this toilet of comparison and assuming that people don't like us, and it's not true. So let's leverage the research from Cornell and Harvard and Yale, and let's be smarter about this. Let's not let our emotions and our insecurities from childhood ruin the potential of amazing adult friendships. Because when you tell yourself that lie, now you know it's destroying your desire to reach out. And here is the truth you need to live by and I need to live by. People like you more than you think. So you better start acting like it. Now, let's move on to lie number three. Lie number three, BFF. Remember that from middle school? We're BFFs, BFFL, BFFs for life. Let's get the matching necklaces of the heart that is like kind of broken in half and you'll wear one and I'll wear the other. Here's the reason why best friends forever is a lie. Best friends aren't always forever. Friends come and go in your life, even your best friends. Friendships fade. They fizzle out. And I've even experienced that over time, sometimes... That best friend that faded or fizzled out because life just does that. It's a natural part of life. Sometimes you find your way back into each other's lives again. Now, the reason why I believe this best friends forever is a lie is because it puts pressure on you. It puts pressure on you to label a friendship and it puts pressure on you to hang on to things just because You've spent a lot of time with somebody. And when you hold on to friendships that no longer feel like a great connection or feel energizing or support who you're becoming, you know what happens when you are friends out of obligation? You start to feel resentment. And the other reason why it is so important to stop telling yourself, you got to be best friends. We got to be best friends forever. Best friends forever. Is because... That pressure that you're putting on yourself to hold on to things that don't feel right anymore, that's the reason why you don't have room for new people to come into your life. And look, if you've been best friends forever and it's working for you, that is freaking awesome. I'm talking about the lie we tell ourselves that if you don't have a best friend forever, somehow you're damaged. If you don't have that lifelong childhood friend, somehow you're an idiot. That if you don't have best friends and you walk around in a squad and you've got Halloween costumes where you're all matching, you've screwed up your life. It puts pressure on you that is completely manufactured and it's totally unnecessary. So what's the truth? The truth is you may not always be friends with somebody forever. 
And that's good. That's good because you want friendships in your life that support your growth. You want friendships in your life that have a mutual exchange of energy. And you need to take the pressure off yourself. And you got to expand the way that you think about friendship. Because when you look at BFF, not as best friends forever, but best friends are flexible. It creates room for growth. It creates room for the kinds of friendships that come in and out of your life based on what you need and what you can give. Doesn't that sound nice? I think it sounds really nice. So here's kind of a new way to think about friendship. It's flexible because friendship is mutual. It's supportive. It's a connection that is based on energy. It's based on what your passion is right now. It's based on what your goals are right now. It's based on the effort that you're putting in. And it's not necessarily based on history. You've experienced this. There could be somebody that'll walk into your life next week and it's literally like you knew them forever. They were the exact person with the exact energy and vibe that you need right now. And that doesn't mean that you're no longer friends with the people that you've been friends with for a long time. It just means that if best friends are flexible, it means that they come in and out of your life in terms of intensity. And I think a lot about this right now because I've just moved. I've moved from a community that I was in for 26 years. I'm still on my text chain with my next door neighbors. I, I'm getting the texts about the fact that there's a fox running around or coyotes were this, or does anybody know a, a, a person that can dog sit? And I'm also still really good friends with all my girlfriends that were in mom's groups together and, you know, people that I've come in and out of my life. But I now live three and a half hours away. And so if you're flexible about friendship, you take the pressure off. And you know that just because you don't see people all the time doesn't mean you're, you're no longer friends. It's going to take a little bit of effort. This idea of flexible friendships is so important. And I want to add a framework to it, okay? We're going to dig deeper into this when we get to the tools near the end of this, which you have to hear because I want the, you to use them. But being flexible about friendship is super important because here's the truth about friendship. Friendships fade. Because when your priorities change, so will your friendships. Like, and I can give you a bazillion different examples of this. Let's say that you're the first of all your friends to get married. You'll start to notice that you start hanging out with other couples more. Why? Because the pattern of your life changed. If you're flexible with friendship, you don't put pressure on yourself. You don't like start to go, oh, are we still friends? Are we not friends? You just know that it's going to require a little bit more energy because the patterns of your life has changed. If you start to see the world differently. Maybe because you're now a vegetarian or you've stopped drinking or you've gotten very active with social justice or you are really committed to your health. The patterns of your life just changed and your friendships will also change. And that's why you need to be flexible in your friendships because again, what is the, so what is the purpose of your friends? It's literally for this mutual supportive exchange of energy that helps you become a better you. Another reason why is that as you start to grow, everything about you changes. And things are going to start to feel forced or draining because they were connected to the old you. So when you realize that a relationship is getting forced, right? Or that it's draining you or it's taking way too much energy, be flexible. And by the way, you've been that person for somebody else. As somebody else has been trying to grow or as their interests have changed or as the patterns in their life, they got a different job, they moved to a different state. It doesn't mean you're no longer friends. It just means it's not as close of a friend anymore because the connection's a little off. The energy, that's okay. You're allowed to grow. You're allowed to move on. And instead of making yourself wrong, instead of feeling guilty, instead of gripping it or forcing it, just be flexible. Just direct your energy in a new relationship. Move toward the people that feel like the light, that feel energizing, that feel like they're aligned with where you're headed instead of holding so tightly to the folks that were with you in places where you've been. It's all good. 
It's all good. And by the way, when you do that, you create space for something new. It's a beautiful thing. Lie number four is really simple. You do not need to be everybody's friend. You can't be everybody's friend. The truth is, not everybody is meant to be your friend. And the second that it feels like a force, be flexible, okay? Here's one of the things that I love to think about, is that you can be the whole package, but if you're delivered to the wrong address, <laughs> not going to work. Another quote that I've seen that I just love is, you could be the most amazing, juicy, end of summer ripe peach. But if you don't like peaches, you're not going to be a fit for that person. Doesn't matter how good you are. Remember, flexibility. I want you to understand this because when you tell yourself, oh, I got to be liked by everybody. Everybody's got to like me. I got to be everybody's friend. That lie turns you into people pleaser. That lie is why you are in your head going, do they like me? How do I need to change? I know I'm a peach and they don't like peaches, but maybe if I disguise myself as a plum, they'll actually like me. Stop doing that. Embrace the fact that you're a peach. Embrace your whole package and stop forcing yourself to be liked by everybody. The reason why this lie is so important to catch is because there's nothing wrong with you. The more you embrace who you are, the more you're honest about what works for you, the more you show up as your full self. Imagine that. Imagine assuming that people just like you, that juicy peach that you are as you are. Imagine if you just assume, imagine if you're flexible. Imagine who might show up, somebody who likes peaches. Wouldn't that be a wonderful change? That's why you got to catch that because this is about energy. This is about you and where you are in your life and where you're going matching with beautiful human beings that are on that same leg of the journey with you. That's what this is about. So be flexible and man, you are a juicy peach. Embrace that stuff. I love peaches, by the way. That's why I love you. Lie number five. Get ready. You're going to hate this one because I hate this one. I'm too busy. I'm too tired. I don't want to go out. I'd rather just stay home. I have social anxiety. I, nah, 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 nah. I'm an introvert. Yes, I've said all these things to myself too. Here's the truth. Friends are critical to a happy life. Friends are the thing that make life meaningful. You deserve amazing friendships and you deserve to be an amazing friend. You know, I, for a long time, I've shared a lot about this. I have felt really freaking lonely and I'm okay being alone. I got no problem walking into a restaurant alone, rolling up to the bar, sitting at the bar and having dinner by myself. In fact, I kind of like doing that. I have no problem going to see a movie alone. I have no problem going for a run or a hike alone. There's a big difference between enjoying time by yourself and being lonely because you don't have friendship in your life and you don't feel a sense of connection or community. And for a really long time, that was me. And the lie I was telling myself is I was too busy. I became addicted to busyness as a way to cover up the fact that I was really lonely. My friends were working. Our kids are all launched. Everybody's scattered in a bazillion directions. I felt like I wasn't seeing my friends. And guess what? My friends felt the same way. Nobody's life was a big party. Everybody is just in their cars, driving here and there, sitting at home, working remote, trying to navigate this crazy thing called life, particularly these last three years. As our kids have gotten older, at least in my case, I find that they need me more, not less. And so I am just like in my little tunnel. And it turns out, so are you. Everybody feels this way. It's not just you. And here's the lie. You're not too busy for one of the most important things in your life. You're not too tired to make the effort for something that brings meaning. You're not too shy or introverted or whatever to make the effort. And I'm really worried about where we are right now. And I'm worried about the fact that because of COVID, that we have got a new default. And the new default is staying home. The new default is, you know, it used to just be that it was hard to get to the gym. 
I think for a lot of us, it's actually hard to get out of your house if you're working there all day. And it takes a lot of effort. I talked about this in our episode, Motivation is Garbage. We talked about something called activation energy. Activation energy is a fancy pants term that I think was developed by that famous psychiatrist at University of Chicago, Chick Me Sent Me High, I think is how you say his name. And activation energy is the force, like we're talking physics, we're talking rocket fuel force that you need to push your rear end out of your house after being on Zoom calls all day to go see a friend. It is so easy to opt out of the book club tonight. It is so easy to not go to that new uh, hockey league or the intramural soccer thing or the lecture at the library because we've gotten used to being alone in our homes. This is so dangerous to your happiness. Do not let the fact that you've gotten used to being home be the reason why you don't five, four, three, two, one, push your rear end out the door and make the effort because the effort's small. The reward is everything. It's enormous. It's profound. In study after study after study, and there's one famous study, you may have heard of it, called the Harvard Men Study, where they studied, uh, they followed groups of men that had graduated from Harvard for over 60 years. So they followed them from their entire adult life. And at the end of the study, it was 100% conclusive that the thing that brings the greatest meaning in your life is the people that you have surrounded yourself with. Now, let's, let's look at that sentence, that you have surrounded yourself with. Sitting at home alone is not how you surround yourself with people. And you and I both know it, and we're both guilty of this. And move into a new town, like many of you have during COVID. How many of you literally changed up your whole life you had this reckoning. You're like, that's it. I'm going to relocate. I'm going to change things up. And now you sit at home alone. You have to make the effort. So that's what we're going to talk about next. You have the five lies. Let me summarize them for you. Lie number one, everybody else's life is a huge party. Not true. Stop saying it to yourself. Either go make a party or just focus on making a few great friends and stop making yourself wrong. Get out of the toilet bowl of comparison. Lie number two, people don't like me. That is a complete lie. You now have the research. Let's use the truth from Cornell, Harvard, and Yale. And people like you more than you think. Start acting like it. Lie number three, BFF. Um, stop saying best friends forever. Stop putting yourself, uh, stop putting pressure on yourself to be friends with everybody forever. It creates resentment. It is a total lie that you have to do it. Let's tell the truth. Friendships need to work for you. Friendships come and go. And the best kinds of friendships are flexible. So take the pressure off yourself and tune into what you need in this stage of your life and where you're going and move toward the people that feel warm, that feel light, that feel energizing, that are supporting where you're going. Be flexible in who's coming and who's going. It is the best way to do this. Lie number four, I need to be everybody's friend. No, you don't. No, you don't. Not everybody is meant to be your friend. You get to be selfish here. Stop putting pressure on yourself. Remember, you are a juicy peach. You got to find people that like peaches. That's what you deserve, okay? And finally, the final lie that is keeping you from having the adult friendships that you deserve is telling yourself you're too busy, you're too tired, you're too this, you're too that to make the effort. The truth is, this is one of the most important aspects of you creating a better life. There is nothing other than your mental health that deserves the effort more. And by the way, you start working on developing some great friendships and your mental health is going to improve too. And that's not just Mel Robbins telling you the common sense. That's research, folks. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.